With new medical advances, the field of cardiovascular medicine is continually changing. On this week's Health Talk, we'll discuss what's new when it comes to car cardiovascular services. So stay tuned, we're coming up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Baser. Today we're going to talk about cardiovascular medicine with Ann Bartolone. She's Director of Cardiovascular Clinical Operations at Norwalk Hospital. And we have a special treat. Joining us back on the set is my co-host, Dr. Andrea Peterson. She took a brief hiatus, but now will be my permanent co-host. So Andrea, welcome back to Health Talk. Thank you so much, Eric. It's really great to be back. I appreciate and Anne, it. Welcome to Health Talk. It's welcome. great to have you back, too. Thank you very Welcome. Much. So, Ann, we were talking a little bit uh, before the show about the fact that there have been so many advances in cardiac care, yet cardiovascular disease remains a really significant problem, doesn't it? It certainly does. We have not completely eliminated the beast. It still exists. Uh, we try to focus our attention now on prevention. It's a very big key point to heart disease. Um, early detection of um, heart disease symptoms and early intervention into, um, into chest pain and uh, heart attack symptoms. Now prevention is, has changed a lot. I shouldn't say, the, we've known a long time how to prevent heart disease. But I think the number of people participating in appropriate preventive uh, action has increased. So what are the mainstay of not getting heart disease or, or preventing heart disease? Probably all the things your mother taught you. you know, exercise, eat in moderation, be careful of the foods that you eat. Just because um, the packaging says that it's um, good for you doesn't mean that it's necessarily good for you. Uh, I think people are much more aware of the quality of the food that they eat, the types of food that they eat the types of exercise that they get. Uh, we've had a lot of medical advances medication-wise with statins. We have many patients that um, are on statins now which help to control the development of heart disease. Um, people are very mindful now of their blood pressures too. Blood pressure, hypertension is a very important key into heart disease. Uh, stress reduction, the things to help us to relax and to make our bodies more comfortable. So really it's about eating well, moving well, uh, keeping a good attitude, um, and taking good care of yourself. And don't smoke. And don't smoke. I feel and that's had a major impact. Just the cessation of smoking, I think, has, has really changed the pace of uh, cardiovascular disease uh, onset. But, but let me ask you, there's been a, I've certainly heard on the news a lot of stuff about saturated fats, unsaturated fats, some fats are good fats, they're not good fats. Where does all that stand now? It, uh, that, there is a lot of research on the fats, the saturated, unsaturated fats, our cholesterols, our HDLs, LDLs, there's a lot of numbers and letters that get thrown around. It can be fairly confusing when people start talking about high, high density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins. Uh, there's a lot of good research out there, there's a lot of good um, information out there, not just on websites. Uh, we encourage people to um, talk to a nutritionist. We have a wonderful nutritionist who works with us at, with our cardiac rehab program at Norwalk Hospital who can really um, put it into everyday terms about reading labels and looking at fats and um, what we have found is very nice um, with society today or with our industry today is that almost everything that you buy and everything you eat has a um, label on it. Yeah. tells you, so it's very easy to scan and see what the fats are, the sodium levels, um, how much fiber is in um, a piece of, um, of whatever it is that you're eating, anything that's on the package, and you can make better choices based on what you read. Learning to read labels is mm -hmm. really important. It also think. seems to me that uh, sort of the simplest words, just everything in moderation. You don't mm -hmm. want to be, you know, be an entirely a, a heavy meat with fat diet. Uh, you don't necessarily, you know, you can eat eggs, but you don't want to eat 25 eggs a day. Mm -hmm. the, the, keeping your calorie count down, keeping your weight controlled, mm -hmm. exercising well, and then, then some of the choices of fats become uh, a minor twitch or a minor uh, thing because you're controlling your overall diet. Right. We should mention, you mentioned statins as a class of medication, and many people know that they may be taking them or they were recommended by their doctors to help control cholesterol and mm -hmm. lipids, um, but they have additional effects 
that are particularly good for preventing uh, and treating cardiovascular disease, don't they? Yes, they do. And uh, what's key with any medication that your physician puts you on is that you should take it. Uh, you should take it as directed. Um, it's not as with the statins or blood pressure medication. It's not something that you just take when you feel until you feel well. They have to be taken as directed. And uh, statins don't work alone. Statins work with a healthy diet and with um, foods in moderation and with uh, a good amount of exercise as well. And we always like to encourage people on this show, if you have questions about your medication, you're not sure why your doctor prescribed that, please ask. Mm -hmm. Please do ask. Yes. Don't just stop it on your own, but fig find out exactly why that was recommended for you. And I think it's also important to realize that for a large group of people, even if they eat perfectly, their genetics are such that they're going to have problems with cholesterol. Uh, I think for a while we put out there the misinformation, not deliberately, but put out there the idea that if you ate properly and exercised, your lipids, your cholesterol would always be under control. And uh, I think we've understood now that it's really a minority of people who can so beautifully control their cholesterol that way. Mm -hmm. And so if you have genetically high predisposition to cholesterol, I think that the statins have almost been miraculous in terms of uh, preventing cardiovascular. My own family, my dad had a heart attack at 55. He had another one in his early 60s. I'm not well back, but past both of the milestones with no cardiac disease that I know of uh, at all. So it's, it's really, and I'm on a statin. So I, I think that they are really fabulous drugs and uh, should not hesitate to take them. The um, side effects tend to be relatively minor. The, people talk about my, muscle cramping, but I think as a whole, mm -hmm. uh, they, they really are uh, a real breakthrough for in cardiovascular disease, and that plus stopping smoking has so much of an influence on reducing cardiac disease in our country. And to your point, Dr. Mazur, when you speak about the fact that um, every medication that you take has a potential for a side effect, and if you're not feeling well on the medication that your physician puts you on, a high blood pressure medication or a statin, um, you should talk to them about it because there's such a big variety now. Well, there's of, so many alternatives. Right. You can find something right. that generally find something that right. works for you. Absolutely. And and both with blood pressure, sorry, no. <laughs> and statins, you know, once they're you, your numbers are good. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you, sh you stop the right. medicines. I think That's so many people say they've right. treated my blood pressure. I'm all better now. I'm going to stop the blood pressure medicine. Right. Don't stop them. You really need to mm -hmm. take them continually because right. it's really that that's changing your metabolism that's allowing you to be mm -hmm. more healthy. Absolutely. Yes. Maybe we can talk a little bit, though, so about what people might experience if they are developing heart disease and what kinds of signs and symptoms they should be watching for. Well, many pa patients, uh, people as they get older, um, or even in our younger population, may start to feel that they're having some chest pain. Um, the classic would be your chest pain, arm pain, back pain, um, shortness of breath. Um, an inability to do the things that you were doing before is usually how you start to see a subtle onset of heart disease. Um, if you think about it, the heart um, is a muscle and its main function is to pump and it's to pump blood. And if anything interferes with that ability to pump blood, you're going to have a downstream effect. You're just not going to have as much energy. You may not be able to climb a flight of stairs. In your exercise routine, you may find yourself more winded than before. And some of it's just transient. Some of it's just you're not having a good day. You didn't get so much sleep. But when you're starting to feel like there's something wrong, that you're not, the same, not in the same kind of health that you were before, you should definitely see your doctor. Uh, we really um, try to focus a lot of our attention now on the, uh, for people to understand the early heart attack symptoms um, and early heart attack um, interventions so that we can prevent what would be um, an angina type of um, problem, which is angina is when the heart muscle does not get enough oxygen, to go from that to become a heart attack. So we really want to prevent that. We really want to be able to intervene. And part of that intervention is really identifying that you are having some kind of heart symptoms. And the symptoms are not typically sharp pain in the chest. In fact, I remember in medical school, we were always taught to ask the question about discomfort mm -hmm. because it can be a sense of pressure. It can be a sense of, uh, of shortness of breath only mm -hmm. uh, with, with very modest exercise. So those could be very important warning signs. And just because it's not painful, it doesn't mean it's not angina, that it's not a problem with the heart not getting enough muscle, right. uh, the heart muscle not getting enough oxygen. And women are different, oh, too. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about that, because women often don't have the classic anginal symptoms. Right. So if you look up you know, chest pain or um, heart attacks on going to Google and the internet and 
are looking at that, you know, they'll talk about the classic uh, presentation of somebody with, who's having a heart attack. Would be your crushing chest pain. Uh, people describe an elephant sitting on their chest, uh, inability to breathe, um, the pain radiating to the arm, to the left arm, um, going to the back, maybe into the jaw and into the neck. Sometimes um, but, with nausea or feeling very sweaty. Right, very sweaty, and then sometimes just feeling like there's something terribly wrong here. And those are the, the easy ones to identify because those are the patients, uh, those are the people that you know tend to call 911 and tend to go right to the hospital because they know something is terribly wrong. Um, and then there's that other area with people that have some indigestion and they've got a little pain between their shoulder blades or my jaw hurts me or it goes to my arm and women for them for them chest pain is not usually the first presentation it usually is very associated with nausea vomiting indigestion and women because we tend to um, put ourselves second and uh, ignore a lot of the symptoms that we have by the time we do present and somebody identifies it with a heart as a heart attack we've lost a lot of time in terms of intervening so that nausea vomiting uh, heartburn are very common symptoms mm -hmm. and we all get those so how should a woman or a man assess whether these are bad enough to go immediately to the emergency room or is just just heartburn the uh, I think everybody has lived in the same skin for their whole life, and you know when something isn't right. You may have had heartburn before when you did you overate or had some um, indigestion because of that. But I think that you you know that something is ter is different about this type of pain. Uh, we would rather that you present, go to your doctor, go to the emergency room, and be wrong about whether this pain was really from your heart, um, than to not show up at all and assume that it's that it is from your heart, that it's not from your heart, that it's your stomach. So really listen to your body mm -hmm. and what it's trying to tell you is what you're saying. And if you have something that is not going away when you might have expected it to go away, it's not starting to get better, mm -hmm. or maybe it's getting worse mm -hmm. and worse, those may be other indications to say, there's something not quite right here, let me get it checked out. And classic heartburn should go away almost immediately when you take an antacid, mm -hmm. whereas heart pain will not. Mm -hmm. So if you take some Maalox or Pepto-Bismol or something, it goes away completely and you feel absolutely fine, you can be relatively assured that it's not heart pain. But as you said, if there's any question, now earlier is always better than later because, and that's changed a little bit. I mean, uh, in the past, we used to just watch heart attacks happen, and I certainly lived through that era. But we don't do that anymore, do we? No. Um, when I first started in nursing school and in nursing, um, that was how we handled heart attacks. We let the, them run their course. We watched them. We were supportive um, in terms of irregular heartbeats and pain control, but there really wasn't a whole lot that we had to offer uh, patients when, who were having a heart attack except su really supportive care. And now we, uh, it's all about early intervention. Our patients come to Norwalk Hospital. They come to our emergency room. Uh, sometimes it's our inpatients who present with chest pain. Um, and the first thing that we do is get a, a 12 lead EKG. It's a painless um, test that's done by putting leads on the chest that assess the electrical patterns of the heart. And when we see damage to the heart, uh, which shows up on that electrical EKG, um, we activate our uh, STEMI team. Um, and STEMI stands for ST Elevation MI, which is a technical term for somebody who's having a heart attack. Um, and within less than 30 minutes, we're going to get you on our cath lab table, and we're going to start to open up the blood vessel that is closed off because that's what's causing your heart attack. You've got a blood vessel which isn't supplying oxygen to the heart muscle itself. And the faster we can get that open, the less damage you'll have to the heart muscle. It's amazing, it's just simply a plumbing problem. Something it is. As, as profound yes. as your life is really a plumbing problem in the heart. Yes, and what we do when we get our patients into the cath lab is we first identify the blood vessel that is giving us the problem. Um, a balloon is inserted. These are very small um, catheters that we use. They're about the size of, um, of a strand of spaghetti. And on the end of them is a deflated balloon. It gets inserted into the blood vessel and opened up and it pushes the, the clot against the walls, and then we reinforce that um, opening with a stent, which um, is like a little wire cage that, that just keeps that blood vessel open. And, and I think what we'll do is that, that we've run out of time for this segment, mm -hmm. but it's, it's truly amazing because you can take someone in the middle of a massive heart attack and literally 
make it go it's away. Right. And the pain goes away, yes. and the patients are suddenly, the heart beats normally. Yes. So I want to talk a little bit about that, as well as the rehabilitation mm -hmm. and some of the other things that happen after someone has heart disease in Absolutely. the next segment. Uh, we need to take a break, and then we'll be back to talk more about cardiovascular operations or cardiovascular illnesses uh, at Norwalk Hospital and the Western Connecticut Health Network. Hi, we're back with Ann Bartolone, the cardiovascular nurse. We were talking about the magic of uh, PAMI, the, <laughs> the uh, opening of the blood vessel when the patient is having a heart attack. So when, op when you open up the blood vessel successfully, what happens? The, the oxygen is then restored to that blood, to that area of the heart where there was not getting oxygen before. And um, the, by the restoring the blood flow, the heart can go back to pretty normal function. Um, there may still be a slight amount of damage done to the heart because there was, a t for a time being, it did not receive the blood uh, flow that it needed, but it does um, incredibly limit the size of the heart attack. Now, the heart is a pump, so the better the pump works, the better the rest of your body works because it's responsible for all those other functions. Um, the supportive care now has to do with really, at that point, once we have opened the blood vessel and restored the blood flow after letting the patient rest, um, is to get them involved in a cardiac rehab program and start to help their heart to get stronger. Just like any other injury that you may have to your leg or any other muscle in your body, uh, we want to quickly restore it to its previous function. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about what cardiac rehab really involves. Well, our cardiac rehab program that we have at Norwalk Hospital, and it's, we have one at Danbury Hospital as well, um, is focused on um, health and wellness. It's um, very supportive. It's a very, um, very focused on exercising a patient in a monitored setting, uh, teaching them about their diet, about exercise, about their medications, about stress reduction, meditation. There are, are so many modules that we work with in our cardiac rehab program. Um, really restoring patients' confidence Many of them are very fragile after they've had a heart attack um, and very concerned about being getting back to their regular activity. I, um, I can certainly understand that. The idea of you've got an injured heart mm -hmm. and you've had a heart attack, again, it may be a bit attenuated because you had a, mm -hmm. the blood vessel open, but you've still had some damage to that heart. A certain fear of, of exercise, mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of sex, of the things that normally are part of your life that uh, you suddenly are afraid that you might precipitate another heart attack. That's why you monitor patients, isn't it? To both reassure them, but also to make sure they don't have any abnormal rhythms as that heart begins to work more aggressively. And um, it's a supervised program, so it's uh, supervised by our nurse practitioner and by our um, exercise physiologists who are very well trained in, uh, in rehabilitation and the function of all the muscles. And they, it's a very individualized program. So if you are a person who came, to, came and was relatively active and healthy uh, prior to your heart attack, or and we also see patients who have had heart surgery. So based on your precondition, we'll determine what your exercise is gonna look like. So if I'm on a treadmill um, next to you, our, uh, our programs are gonna be totally different based on where we stand, um, what our injury was, and, um, and how we're progressing. So it's very monitored. Um, patients are with us for um, about 12 weeks, 12 to 16 weeks. We also have the option of having them go to an extended recovery, uh, extended um, supervision program after they're done with their acute program. Is that indefinite, that extended recovery program? They can, um, they can sign up and continue to go in a supervised setting. Some of our patients will transition to a regular gym afterwards, but many of them like the, um, just like the, the care and attention that they receive from the team that, that, that saw them when they were just starting out. Well, it sounds very much like whole person care because of course the heart attack doesn't happen just to the heart, it happens to the whole mm -hmm. person and can affect families as well in a real way. Do you see people able to make real changes in their, in their lifestyle 
having gone through these programs? Absolutely. It's very amazing to see. Having the, the program at Norwalk Hospital, we have our cardiac cath lab, which is uh, adjacent to our cardiac rehab center. So, so many times we see patients that we have done interventions on, and they then we see them come down the hall a few weeks later for cardiac rehab. We have patients that are totally deconditioned, who have never exercised a day in their life, um, have horrible diets. They just they don't take care of themselves. They're smokers. They, they've um, not been following their, their um, physician's directions. And to see the transformation is absolutely fabulous. And by the end of their program, they have nothing but complimentary things to say about how far they've come. And it's really meaningful, right? Because patients themselves can decrease their risk of having another heart attack if they do all, all this work and really make changes to their lifestyle. And you think about that as, as that person makes that changes, their husband or wife is making changes. Their family members are starting to make changes because now that's their history. If dad had a heart attack, that means that you now have a family history of heart disease. And so it really is a wake-up call for many family members to say it's time for me to start taking care of myself. So it has um, a big effect on their whole system as well as their friends, family, everybody starts to get a little bit more awake into it. It's a shame that so often it takes a real event for people to accept their own mortality and respond to that and live a healthy lifestyle. It, yes. uh, it really is an awakening to suddenly realize that you're fragile, that you, mm -hmm. you, you, these things can happen to you. Right. Right. And um, that's, I think, the, the emotional part of it. We do a lot of um, emotional support for our patients. The different programs that we have, the um, nutrition program, the uh, stress reduction program, meditation, medication review, really help to support them and make them feel that they're not just a patient, that they don't just have a disease, and that the things that we want to incorporate can really incorporate into their lifestyle and everybody else's lifestyle. I'm curious, what do you do for the stress reduction part? We have um, a, a class on stress reduction. Uh, we teach our patients how to identify their stress triggers. Um, how to yell and, at the boss. <laughs> <laughs> and how to, and how our, their body actually reacts to stress and why stress is um, so harmful to the, to the body. And then offer um, methods for them to start to work on their stress reduction. Everybody's method's gonna be different. For some people, you, you will encourage them to do yoga. For some people, it's a walk around the block or you know, listening to music. Everybody is very individualized. But we start to give them techniques and methods that they can use to reduce their stress. And I hear a lot about mindfulness uh, in this era as a way of managing stress. Is that part of what you, you mentioned yoga? I know that's sort of a component of that. Do you, do you talk about that with your patients? Yes, the, when we do our classes on stress reduction and a meditation, we really focus on the fact that you're here, you're, this is where you are right now. Um, maybe this is, maybe there are some changes you wanna make in your life. It's gonna be a staged. It's not gonna be something that happens overnight. We also don't wanna stress people about the fact that yeah, they need <laughs> to be stressed <laughs> about being they, reducing your stress. Right, but uh, we find that the, uh, we do include families in our meetings and um, our educational offerings are all include everybody so that they uh, everybody's involved in the care of their patient. You know, we have a, a couple minutes left um, in the show and I, I did want to give you a chance to talk about some of the community outreach that is going on as well because we've talked a lot about what happens to the individual patient and a little bit about the family, but educating the community um, and helping be, people be healthier in, out in the community is really important as well, isn't it? Yes, it is. And I'm very proud to say that Norwalk Hospital and Danbury Hospital, we are both um, uh, accredited as chest pain centers. And that puts us on a national level looking at all the standards of how we take care of patients with heart disease, how we identify early heart attacks, how our EMS responds, how, um, what kind of services we provide within our hospital to, to deal with patients who have chest pain and heart disease. Um, but the big focus is on community and outreach for um, early heart attack um, care and early heart attack intervention, uh, teaching our, um, our communities about 
the, about heart disease, their symptoms, and one of the big focuses has been on the use of AEDs. Those and are tell um, what that is. automatic um, external defibrillators, and you'll see them in the community, they're in airports, they're in schools now, uh, but pe people have to really understand how to use them. Um, Norwalk Hospital has partnered with uh, s several organizations, um, as well as Danbury Hospital, to have community programs called, you may have seen the flyers around, called hands-only CPR classes. Uh, we've had them at the beach this summer. We had them um, on the days when they had the concerts um, in Norwalk. And it was a short educational program about the symptoms of heart disease and what to do if somebody suddenly collapses and how to use an AED. It's fine to say, you know, oh, if uh, somebody collapses, go use the AED. But if you've never opened it up to see how it performs and how to turn on the buttons and what it feels like and what, the, what it sounds like, you'd be, less in, you'd be less very hesitant about going to intervene if somebody did collapse. So we and have- we're very blessed in this community because mm -hmm. one of our trustees at Norwell Hospital, one of our neighbors in Westport, uh, actually saved a young man in Westport, I think uh, playing soccer or something like that, uh, with his AED he happened to have in his trunk. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has now donated and the hospital has matched it and just helped distribute a number of AEDs around our community. So this is really part of the, I think, the, the hospital, the health providers trying to improve the health of our communities. Absolutely, yes. so important. Great. And CPR has always, we have many people that are afraid to intervene or with CPR because of the mouth-to-mouth -mouth part seems to be the, the piece that people are most hesitant about. And then we're going to have to stop it at that because <laughs> we've run out of time. But I think well, we've done shows on CPR. We should do another one to okay. really talk about that. So I want to thank Ann. And when we come back, we'll have today's health question. Right now, let's take a look at some of the upcoming events sponsored by Western Connecticut Health Network. Hi, this week's viewer question is, are heart attacks hereditary? Well, we're very lucky to have an expert on set here to help answer that. So, Anne, are heart attacks hereditary? Yes and no. I think that a definitive we, are, answer. <laughs> we are all shaped by our genetics and our family history. Um, but I think that if you have a family member who has heart disease, it makes you more at, di at risk of developing heart disease. But now with all the different treatments and early interventions that we have and medications and awareness of heart disease, we you can maybe even change your gene genetics. Just because your dad had a heart attack does not mean that you will have it. But that means that you have to be very proactive about your health, about exercise and fitness and um, your cholesterol and your lipid levels, um, exercising and eating right, and hopefully you will be able to reverse that. You can't change your heredity. You can't change the fact that you're male versus female or your age. As we age, there's also a factor to heart disease. So yes and no, it is hereditary, but I think that we can definitely help to shape what our story is going to be. In it's our putting life, so. the odds in your mm -hmm. favor by doing those right things. You can stop and then smoking, I and stop. Yeah, manage your blood glucoses mm -hmm. if you have diabetes, yeah. make sure you take your blood pressure medications mm -hmm. as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. And your cholesterol exercise, the right. 150 minutes a week or whatever <laughs> yes. the current recommendation is, but, but aerobic exercise. And then the other, I think, wonderful thing is to recognize that if we have a heart attack, if you heart, have heart disease, the treatments today are really uh, remarkably better than they were 25 years ago. Uh, people are surviving heart attacks with minimal or no cardiac damage, which right. is and sort of amazing. And our takeaway message is to call 911 if you have heart disease symptoms because the earlier we can get to you, yep. a, um, an ambulance is a little hospital on wheels, and the earlier we can get to you and start taking care of you, the less damage you'll have. And that's it's a, a perfect message. message to end on. Thank you, Ann. Thank you so much You're for welcome. coming on the show yeah. today. Thank if you, you at home have a question you'd like to ask Andrea and me on Health Talk, please contact us at uh, healthtalk at norwalkhealth.org. want to Thank our guest today. Thank our guest today, Ann Bartalone, for coming on the show. We'll see you next week on Health Talk. Thanks, Ann.